Anyway, I want to ask you guys, um, how many of you regularly read the Bible? Now, I hope all of you raised your hands. Um, it, it is so important. It's critical to your, to your spiritual growth. Do you remember when you, when you first accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior and you got your very first Bible and you, and you couldn't wait? You got dig in, you started reading it, and you were excited about it until you got to that difficult passage, that, that place where you just couldn't understand it. And you started putting it down. Well, don't, don't give up. Don't give up. That's where study comes in. The Apostle Paul told Timothy, he said, Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. As we grow in the Lord, we need to commit ourselves to studying God's word. Now, it takes discipline and commitment, but you can do it. I would suggest that you, uh, that you get yourself uh, a Bible dictionary, maybe uh, a commentary or two. Um, those things really, really are helpful. And nowadays, um, you can use Google. And, uh, and you can, there's some online tools like uh, Blue Letter Bible or uh, Bible Gateway. Those are really helpful. And, and when you get to the, to the uh, difficult passages, you can, you can use them to kind of help you. And, and they're free, so you have no excuse. Let's study God's Word, right? So please turn in your Bibles with me to Psalm chapter 1. Um, the book of Psalms was poetically written, um, and, and, and it, was, uh, it was put to music, and then the Jews would sing the Psalms. One of the reasons that people really, really um, love the Psalms is that they can identify their own experiences in the Psalms. This morning, we're going to just study the first three verses of chapter 1. So let's read this passage, and then we'll study it. It says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth fruit in its season, whose leaf, shall not, or whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper." Let's pray and ask God to lead us this morning. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for yet another opportunity to dig into your word, especially during this time when our church can't meet together like we're used to. I pray that with all lowliness and gentleness and long-suffering, we would bear with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Now, may your Holy Spirit guide us this morning. And, and, and as we open your precious word, we praise you, we love you, we come to you with open hearts and minds. Fill us with your wisdom, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. As I told you, the book of Psalms was written in, uh, in Hebrew, in Hebrew poetic form, and often the Hebrew writers used uh, comparison and contrast uh, to emphasize a theme or a message. In today's text, the writer used uh, righteousness versus ungodly, uh, the righteous and the ungodly. We see that in verse 6. If you read in verse 6, it says, For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the godly shall perish. Now, there's some key words that we find throughout the, the chapter that are going to help us understand it. And the first word we come to is the word blessed. It says, blessed is the man, right? Um, that word blessed in Hebrew is asher. It's, uh, let, me, let me ask you something. If, if I say, boy, that guy's really blessed, 
what's the first thing that comes to your mind? Now, if we're honest, we start thinking about material possessions. Is that right? Well, that's partially true, but the Bible has a different perspective. In Matthew, 20, or Matthew 19, 23, Jesus um, said, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, when he said this, his disciples were blown away. And they said, who then can be saved? Like us, they believed that wealth or material possession was an evidence of God's blessing. Um, Jesus gave us his definition of of the term blessing in, in Matthew chapter 5. We read, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. Uh, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. And blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. And blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of God. And and blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Now, I didn't see any mention of material possessions there, did you? Not exactly what we thought immediately, was it? So, That's why we need to study God's word so that we don't come to the wrong conclusions. Study is so important. By the way, if you are blessed and you have material possessions, that's a a good thing. Proverbs 10.22 says, The blessings of the Lord make one rich. So if you are blessed, understand where it came from. Uh, A lot of times we like to take credit for our own successes, our own wealth. Man, I worked hard for that, right? Um, But, you know, it says here that in Scripture, it's plain, it came from God. And uh, and so we we need to remember that. And and God expects us to be good stewards of what he provides. So, with that in mind, let's turn back to Psalm chapter 1. And uh, and the next word in the the text, the the key word that we want to look at is walk. Walk in the Hebrew mind is is your conduct. It's um, the way you live your life. It's, it's what, we, what defines you. It's what you do and how you do it. Um, you might ask me, well, Mark, what do you do? And I'd say, well, I'm a safety manager. So immediately in your mind, you begin to pick, make a picture. What was, you know, what's this guy like? Hopefully it's a nice picture. Nerd, maybe. I don't know. Um, a verse that uses a walk in, in the scripture that, that really defines it is in Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians 4 1 says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. In other words, we need to conduct ourselves in, in such a way that it's obvious to our, our family, our co workers, to those around us that we're followers of Jesus. Um, We find this, an example of this in Acts chapter 4, verse 13. Remember the Pharisees were were kind of observing some of the the disciples and, and and it says that now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, they perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, but they marveled. They took note concerning them that they had been with Jesus. Wow! (laughs) <laughs> man, I hope that when people see me and they take note of me, that they, they say, you know, that guy's been with Jesus. Wouldn't that be awesome? Another verse that we see the word walk in the New Testament is Galatians 5.16. And, and here it says, if you walk in the Spirit, you won't fulfill the lusts of the flesh. And then, and then Paul goes on in that same chapter to explain kind of what it looks like to walk in the flesh. Eesh. Not very good. 
But in verse 22, he begins to describe the, the fruit of the Spirit. See, God expects us to produce fruit, uh, and, and the fruit that will last, and that will be a blessing to, to those around us. The next, uh, the next word in, in Psalm chapter 1, the next key word is counsel. Counsel is advice. It's uh, instruction that comes from a, a belief system. It's, it's wisdom. So what does the Bible tell us that wisdom is? Um, if you turn with me to, to James chapter uh, 4, I'm sorry, James 3, verse 13, it says, um, Who is the wise and understanding among you? Let him show by his good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, and demonic. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing is there. Now this is a stark picture of, of worldly wisdom. It's the Look out for number one that we get from, from everywhere, right? That's the worldly wisdom. But by contrast, James explains godly wisdom in the, in the very next verse. He said, but wisdom that comes from above is first pure, and then it's peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. So when the writer of Psalm 1 was saying, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, he, he means that, that we need to be careful where we go to for advice, for wisdom. We shouldn't go quickly to the world. But it's implied there that we need to go to the word of God, to God for, for wisdom that comes from above. The Apostle Paul in Romans 12, 2 says, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now that word conformed, conforming is allowing the world to shape us. I remember back in the 70s, that's how old I am, um, I wanted to wear bell bottoms because all my friends wore bell bottoms, right? And, and boy, I wanted to fit in. And so I took my my jeans, and I, I took them to my mom, and I said, can you just rip the seams up to the, to the knee and then just sew in some material so they'd flare out, right? Now, I didn't care if they matched or not. I, just, I was styling, right? I show pictures to my kids, and they just kind of shake their heads. I wonder about their fads today, where they wear their pants or they're about ready to fall down around their ankles. We won't go there. But th that's what conforming looks like, guys. We, we, we get, we want to be like the world, kind of like what Professor, uh, whatever his name was this morning, talked about the children. The, the, the children of Israel wanted to fit in like the other nations. They wanted a king, right? That's conforming. That's conforming to the wisdom of the world. Um, Paul says, don't be conformed, but be, what, transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now, that word transformed is the Greek term metamorpho. Well, that sounds like a term we use today, right? Metamorphosis. Metamorphosis is the process by which a caterpillar turns into a butterfly. What a graphic illustration. Paul's saying that as a Christian, this is what we're supposed to look like. Um, we, we, we were formerly walking through this world like a caterpillar, walking through worldly wisdom. But once we come to Christ, we're transformed. If you read in 2 Corinthians 517, it says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Can you picture yourself as a beautiful butterfly? The next word in Psalm 1 is the word stand. Stand. It's the Hebrew word, Hebrew word amad. It, it means to stand with or to stand for. Um, the, the, the verse in, in Psalm 1 was, he says, nor stands 
in the path of sinners. So what the writer is telling us is, do not unite yourself in, if, with the world in sin. Paul put it this way in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. He says, do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship has unrighteousness with lawlessness? Church, if you want to experience God's blessing in your life, you need to be careful who you stand with, who you yoke yourself with. These are tough times. I understand that. And many of you are, are struggling just to get by in this pandemic era that we're, we're living in, social distancing. And, you know, it, it's just tough. Jesus is inviting us to yoke with him. In Matthew 11, we read, he says, Come to me, all you who are what? Weary and heavy laden. And I, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. What? You will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. People, we're not designed to carry such heavy loads. None of us can stand up to under, under the pressure, all the pressures of, of this life. People try to. Yes, they do. And that's why there's so many mental breakdowns and, and depression. People turn to psychologists and, and doctors who, who prescribe medication just for people to cope. When, when all along, our creator, the one who designed us, is there inviting us to come to him. And, and he will give us rest and respite. Um, Chuck's, or, uh, the next word, the next word in uh, Psalm 1 is sit. Sit is uh, yashav. It means to, to remain or to dwell with. Chuck Smith in his, uh, in his commentary on Psalm 1 pointed out, he says a progression of practice. Walking leads to standing, which in turn leads to sitting. Isn't life like that? The world subtly draws us in. And, and we begin to dabble into something questionable. Well, it's not sin, we might say. Uh, we, we start to compromise, giving in to maybe peer pressure. And then, and then we conform. Slowly but surely, we begin to justify uh, our actions. And, and then we stubbornly uh, defend ourselves. And, and, and we've bought hook, line, and sinker into this worldly wisdom. James uh, 1, 14 through 15 says, But each one of us uh, is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then, when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. Can, can you see that progression? The next word in Psalm 1 is the word scoffers. It's those that, that don't fear God and, and mock him out of pride. Now, I need to be careful because one of my things is I, I enjoy a good sarcastic comment here and there. But sarcasm is a form of scoffing. It's, it's uh, making light of something serious or, or maybe a negative response to something positive. Pessimists. Pessimists are usually scoffers. Beware of pessimists. They'll always bring you down. They never, never see the bright side of things. Second Peter 3 tells us, he says, scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since our fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. And then Peter goes on to compare these scoffers to the people in the days of Noah. See, Noah, for 120 years, tried to warn these people, and they never, they never listened. 
Finally, the day came for God to judge the world and they missed the boat, literally. They fell short of the glory of God. So in summary of of Psalm 1, let me say that, that we need to be very, very careful where we go to and what we decide to follow. Proverbs uh, 13, 15 says, the way of the transgressor is hard. Did you catch that? The way of the transgressor is hard. Don't go to the transgressor for advice, people. It's going to be hard. 1 Corinthians 15 says, do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. Please, please choose who you want to listen to for advice very, very carefully. Verse 2. Verse 2 in Psalm 1 starts out with the word but, signaling a contrast. Instead of, rather than searching for satisfaction in the world, the blessed man, he finds his delight in God's word. Let me ask you, what delights you? Where do you find your joy? Our Declaration of Independence talks about our right to the pursuit of happiness. Now, I'm proud to be an American, and I don't want to disparage our Constitution in any way, but I I have to be careful because these documents, these historical things like the Declaration of Independence were written from a worldly perspective. As I was pondering this the other day, Um, I posted something on Facebook. I I wrote it. It says, um, some people pursue happiness, others create it. And and then I referenced Philemon. I don't know if you've read the book of Philemon. It's just one chapter. But but Philemon was a delightful person. He's just fun to be around. You know people like that? That, that, That's the kind of person you want to be around. So um, in in Psalm 1-2, it says, Blessed is a man who who finds delight in God's word. Um, Not only that, but this this blessed man, he he meditates continually day and night on God's word. Can I tell you that you will be blessed if you find your joy, your delight in God's word. Verse 3 summarizes the first a few verses by describing how God sees blessing. Picture a a majestic tree planted by a stream that's weathered storm after storm. This verse talks about how this tree brings forth its fruit in season. And then it culminates at the end by saying, whatever he does prospers. Now, In Scripture, water is a type of God's Word. So this tree here is planted right near rivers of God's Word. Can you imagine its root system going deep down into that soil and being enriched by the the water of the Word? Colossians 2 says, As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him, and it says, rooted in, and built up in him, established in the faith, as you have been taught, abounding with it in thanksgiving. Can you see yourself as that tree? The word planted in that verse it doesn't mean, it means that, that that tree didn't just happen to grow there. No, no, it was intentionally put there, right next to the, to the river of God's word. It was either planted or transplanted there. People, I've talked to people and, 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 and they've told me, well, when it comes to my children, I don't want to influence them when it comes to, to uh, religion. I, I just want them to kind of figure out for themselves what they want to believe in. Can I tell you, that is foolishness. Absolute foolishness. The Bible is very clear and it tells us that we as parents are responsible to teach our children about God and about his word. Deuteronomy 6 6 through 7 says, And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children uh, and, and shall talk with them when you sit in your house 
And you walk by the way. And when you lie down. And when you rise up. Continually, we need to be teaching our children about God. Now, just because you do doesn't guarantee that they're going to follow the Lord. But it's still our responsibility. We still have that obligation to raise them in the admonition of the Lord. So don't neglect your duty. Plant them next to rivers of living water. It goes without saying that each one of us, we have a a, a responsibility to make a choice ourselves. Right? God... uh, uh, it, it, the, the way uh, Joshua put it in, in the book of Joshua, it says, Choose for yourself this day whom you will serve, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Now, like, like the children of Israel whom Joshua was speaking to, many of us had parents who did plant us near livers, rivers of living water. They took us to church, and they, they taught us what it is to be a follower of Jesus. Now, it's up to you to tap into that living water, the Word of God, and to grow deep roots and and soak in that, that rich truth that will produce fresh, vibrant fruit for the kingdom of God. Understand this, God does not have grandchildren. Just because your parents believed in God and served Him doesn't mean that you inherit a relationship with God. No, no. He wants each one of us to make our own choice whether or not to follow him, to make him Lord of our lives. Now, if you haven't done that, I pray that you will soon. The last phrase in this verse talks about prospering. And I'm sure that you've heard the term prosperity gospel. There's a lot of that going on around here. I'm not going there this morning, and and this chapter in the Bible is not going there. What I want to do is kind of take a look and see how God sees prosperity. Biblical prosperity does not mean that you will not suffer hardship. In fact, Jesus told us in John 16, he said, in this world, you will have tribulation. But he said, be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. But the Bible gives us a tremendous promise we can hold on to, even in hardship. In Romans 8, 28, it says, um, we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. So can God really take something that was meant to harm us and turn it into good? Absolutely. Absolutely. We read about that. A great example is in, in, in Genesis, in the, in the life of Joseph. Let's kind of go through his life. First, um, he was unjustly sold into slavery by his brothers. And then he was unjustly accused by his master's wife, thrown into prison. And then he was left in prison for 13 years, forgotten. But God was with him all that time. And eventually, um, he raised him to be the second most powerful man in all of Egypt. And at the end of Genesis, what we read, when the brothers um, were afraid of his his, his revenge, he responded, but as for you, you meant evil against me, but God, he meant it for good in order to bring about as it is this day to save many people alive. See, Joseph is a classic example of that tree that we read about in Psalm 1. The fact that the writer was inspired to, uh, by God to choose a tree as, a, as an illustration is interesting. Trees are talked about all throughout Scripture. But there's one particular uh, passage in, in Revelation. It's the very end of the, cha- of the verse, very end of Revelation, very end of the Bible, uh, chapter 22. I want to I read for you, and it kind of shows this same picture. The, uh, John, the apostle John was describing heaven. He wrote, and, and he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and the Lamb. And verse 2 says, In the middle of its streets, on either side of the river, was what? The tree of life. Um, 
which bore 12 fruits, each yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for healing of the nations. Isn't that cool? It's the same tree. There's so much more we could go into about trees, but we just don't have time this morning. So I, I, I want to I let you know that, that I've been praying for all of you. <laughs> I know that this is, this is a tough season in life. We're going through something we've never gone through. My heart goes out to you. And I want to leave you with this final thought. Whatever your circumstances, no matter how long you've been enduring hard times, wherever you may be today, I bring you this reminder. The stronger the winds blow, the deeper your roots grow. The longer the winds blow, the more beautiful the tree. And that tree will become a, a shelter and a refuge for many. People, God have, hasn't abandoned you. But he has promised to, to walk with you through the storms. He has provided and preserved his word to guide you and comfort you as you navigate this treacherous life. So take courage, my friends. Read and study your Bibles. Allow God to bless you in it. And if you need prayer, you need to talk to someone, I'm here. The staff is here. Please don't hesitate to reach out. May the Lord bless each and every one of you. Let's pray. Father in heaven, once again, we, we thank you for your word that you inspired and preserved for us. Thank you for faithful men that, that translated your word into our language so that we can read it and understand it, and study it. Thank you for your Holy Spirit that is so faithful to, to guide us and to give us proper interpretation. Father, there are many in our church today who, who are struggling May they find comfort in your word. May your Holy Spirit guide them through the storms. Provide for them, Lord. May, may your spirit um, give them the comfort that only you can provide. We ask, Lord, that you, that you heal our land from this, this pandemic, this COVID-19. Watch over our missionaries, Lord, as they, as they take the gospel to the ends of the world in obedience to you. Keep them safe, Lord. And Lord, we, we ask a special blessing on our leaders. We ask for your wisdom as they lead us, Father. And we ask all these things in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you.